Please welcome Dr. Ann. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea, for your introduction and for sharing your talent to moderate tonight. I'm grateful to uh, my great friends, the Prevent Cancer Foundation and the National Museum for Women in the Arts for the honor of being a part of this esteemed panel. And most especially, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my passion with you. As a physician who really is on a never-ending crusade to motivate, inspire, and ultimately empower as many people as I can with the knowledge they need to live their healthiest life, nothing engages my, um, nothing ignites my passion more than engaging with a live audience and sharing with them what the very best science tells us are the very best ways through diet and lifestyle to just say whoa to cancer. And before I let it fly, I'm going to make sure you know what lies at the root of my sort of wild and crazy enthusiasm for this topic. And a simple one word answer is science, because deep down inside, I'm nothing more than a total science geek. And it just so happens that since the early 80s, there has been a virtual avalanche of rock solid, truly mind bending, eye popping new science telling us loud and clear that diet and lifestyle and good health and diet and lifestyle and disease are powerfully and inextricably linked, and that we really do have enormous control over our future health destiny by being mindful of the foods and beverages that cross our lips and the lifestyle practices that we engage in day in and day out. And thankfully, cancer prevention is no exception. Uh, based on my knowledge, there is broad scientific consensus that up to 70% of the entire cancer burden we face each and every day in this country could be prevented through healthy eating, healthy lifestyle practices, some of the strategies that Carolyn was referring to, and adhering to the recommended cancer screening test. Uh, and this is, this is remarkable to think about. I mean, what a glorious reality. And so I'm here with you to share uh, the most powerful evidence-based diet and lifestyle strategies to lower your cancer risk. And I'm specifically going to talk about eight, and the first four are in order of importance. So it's very important to remember that. I'll remind you as we go through. The first one is something that I'm sure you're all aware of, and that is the importance of abstaining from exposure to tobacco in any form. Do not smoke or do use tobacco products. We know that uh, tobacco is responsible for at least 30% of all cancer deaths and 80% of lung cancer deaths, okay? So strictly avoid tobacco in any form. So if you're a smoker or use tobacco products, the single most powerful thing you could do to lower your cancer risk is to stop smoking. If you're a non-smoker, the single most powerful thing you can do to lower your cancer risk is to keep your weight in the healthy range. We now know that being overweight is a convincing risk factor for many cancers, including postmenopausal breast cancer, uterine cancer, esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, kidney cancer, growing evidence for leukemias and lymphomas. And there's important things to understand about the relationship between body weight and cancer relative to the other uh, diseases of which, which we know that being overweight is a problem for. And one of the things we see with cancer is that the risk mounts before you cross the line. The risk for cancer mounts before you cross the line from normal weight to being overweight. And so the name of the game is to be as lean as possible within the normal range of body weight. And this is important, to do everything you can to have weight stability in, after the age of 21 in your adult life. Meaning, not only does your weight matter, we also see specifically for postmenopausal breast cancer, that Weight you gain after the age of 21 significantly increase your risk for postmenopausal breast cancer. What am I telling you? Let's say you're 21 and you're super lean. You're like, your BMI is 21. Uh, normal BMI is anything less than 25. And you're now 55 
And your weight is still in the normal range, but your BMI is, let's say, you know, 20, right at 25. You've significantly increased your risk of developing postmenopausal breast cancer. All right? So weight control, especially keeping that belly flat and keeping your weight stable as an adult is critically important. It's the second most, if second to not smoking is, is the most powerful thing you can do to lower your overall cancer risk. Number three, be physically active every day. And I'm so passionate about um, the virtues of physical activity because you know, I've read the science and I just remain in total awe, in total awe of what we know about regular physical activity and what it can do to diminish you know, the full spectrum of chronic diseases. And uh, we have, the data is convincing that regular physical activity will lower your risk of colorectal cancer. There is strong evidence for postmenopausal breast cancer, some evidence for premenopausal breast cancer, and good evidence for uterine cancer. I think as time marches on, we'll see many other cancers add to that list. We just need more data. What should you do? Strive for a minimum of 30 minutes of moderate aerobic activity that's equivalent of a brisk walk each and every day. As the optimum for cancer protection, strive for an hour of moderate aerobic activity, again, like a brisk walk each and every day, or if you're like me and you love to kick it up and you enjoy doing vigorous uh, aerobic activity, you can do 30 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity each and every day. Another really, really important sort of developing, sort of mind-blowing uh, health and medical story, in addition to making sure you're physically active each and every day, you must also avoid, I feel sort of guilty, y'all, sitting, avoid prolonged sitting. And this is what we're, fi what, we're finding, what we're finding out, and this is really, 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 really important for you to grasp. What we're finding out is not enough to be physically active each and every day. If you want to maintain your health and avoid premature mortality and premature chronic disease and, and, and certain cancers, especially colon cancer and postmenopausal breast cancer, you must also avoid prolonged sitting. And I'll tell you that there has been some just, again, mind-blowing studies come, that have just been published over the last three years. And if the, those studies are replicated, if we keep seeing that data, we're going to be able to say the single greatest cause of premature death in America is prolonged sitting. So this is important stuff. And there's all sorts of little strategies that you can build into your life to make to make you get up. Like, I have a stand-up desk. It's totally transformed my life, improved the quality of my, my life in so many different ways. And I could go on and on about the little tips to make you get up. But please understand that, that prolonged sitting is deadly. It is an independent, established risk factor for colorectal cancer and breast cancer, OK? All right, moving on. Number four. So this is the fourth one. And again, the first four in order of importance is to restrict calorically dense processed foods and avoid, avoid means do not drink sugary beverages. All right, what do I mean by calorically dense processed foods? Those are those nutritionally defunct, super fattening foods like traditional fast foods and junk foods like chips and candy and then the sweet things like cupcakes and pastries and donuts and things like that I know you never eat. So that's what we're talking about, but calorically dense foods. And you know what sugary beverages are, any sugary beverages, soda, fruit drinks, sports drinks, sports beverages, those dessert coffees, sweet tea, all right? Why is it so important to restrict your intake and, and avoid the sugary beverages? Because that category of foods that we, I just mentioned, it's convincing that they will increase your risk of weight gain and obesity. We know this, we know this, we know this. They're very, very obesogenic foods. The, and, and because weight control is so important for cancer protection, that's why it's number four. Additionally, there are two other problems with those foods. If you eat those foods, they naturally crowd out the cancer protective foods that I'll share with you in a minute. And in addition to their unique obesogenic uh, propensities, those foods also are home to specific ingredients that we are concerned, independent of their uh, caloric contribution, can increase the risk of cancer. Things like excess sugar, too much salt, 
uh, refined carbs like white flour, trans fats, saturated fats, okay? So really, really important. And just so you know, sugary beverages, please drink Athena water. Sugary beverages have absolutely emerged, the data is very clear, as the most fattening, the most metabolically metabolically disruptive form of uh, uh, calories on the planet. And a calorie is not a calorie. Please understand that. In the body, the, quali you know, the, the qualitative aspects of the cal you eat, calories you eat are very important because the way your body responds to them hormonally and metabolically is totally different depending on, you know, again, is it from fat, is it from carb, good carb, bad carb, that sort of thing. Okay, moving on. The remaining four, we cannot rank them. Uh, so I'll just say they're on par with one another. So the fifth one is uh, eat a ton of plants. Eat a ton of plants. Whole, real, plant-based foods. And if there's one thing in which there is universal agreement amongst all nutrition experts, that it, and that would be that, because there's, there's a lot of things that sometimes we don't agree on, but there's one thing we all agree on, and that the healthiest diet in the world is a plant-based diet. So make sure you consume lots of fruits and vegetables, brightly colored fruits and vegetables, especially those non-starchy vegetables, physically intact whole grains like you know, quinoa and brown rice and barley and oatmeal, dense high fiber cereals, and of course miracle beans. Those are the plant-based foods, also nuts and seeds. Uh, and why do we want you to do that? Because we know the, the, there's really three reasons for cancer protection. The most important one is that if you eat lots of plant-based foods, we, the data is absolutely unequivocal. It will help you with, with maintaining a healthy body weight. People that eat the most whole, real plant-based foods are definitely leaner than people that don't. So they naturally build in through all sorts of spectacular ways, appetite control and weight control. Additionally, they are home to a dazzling array of cancer protective nutrients, things like folate and vitamins A, C, and E, and fiber, and uh, those amazing carotenoid phytochemicals and the polyphenols. We could just go on and on about uh, their anti-cancer power through the, through the uh, essential nutrients and the phytochemicals that they house. And the other thing is, if you eat the plant-based foods, again, it sort of naturally is going to crowd out those high-risk obesogenic foods that we talked about earlier. Uh, number six, limit red meat. Um, red meat is a convincing a convincing cause of colorectal cancer, especially processed meats. Processed meats repeatedly rear their ugly heads. In fact, if you look at the totality of the data, scientists know no safe limit for any level of intake of processed meats in terms of cancer. And what are the processed meats? Unfortunately, the things that everyone tends to love, like sausage and bacon and bologna, you know, bologna and salami and ham. Um, what do we see is in terms of red meat, what cancers are? I mentioned colorectal cancer, but again, it's uterine, esophageal, pancreatic. Um, there's not, oh, lung, even lung, okay? The data's not quite as powerful as it is for colorectal, but again, there's a number of other cancers. It's not just colorectal. Uh, and my best advice, my standard advice, is to limit red meat to two servings or less a week and strictly avoid, to the best of your ability, processed uh, meats, especially processed meats that contain nitrites or nitrates. You can sort of look in the ingredients list because uh, we're, we're particularly concerned about at that aspect of the process, uh, processed meats. Number seven, alcohol. Uh, alcohol use is an established risk factor for a laundry list of cancers, and I think the most important one for women to be aware of, because I'm blown away by, in my interactions with women, I would, I would guesstimate, and I've been sort of querying women, women now for about a decade about this, like if I'm in an audience, I'll say, hey, raise your hands if you're aware of this. I usually get about maybe 10 to 15 percent. It's getting a little bit better. It, but you need to know that alcohol is the single most powerful nutritional risk factor we know of for breast cancer. And that even having one drink a day will increase breast cancer risk, looking at the study, 7 to 8%. Going from one to two, the risk will increase 25 to 30%. And we see that very, very, very consistently. There's a direct dose response relationship. Alcohol is a very much underappreciated cause of breast cancer. Colorectal cancer for men and women 
You get to two or go above, you've increased your risk of getting colorectal cancer. Beyond two drinks for both men and women, it's going to be liver cancer, esophageal, cancers of the head and neck. All right? So very, very important. And current advice is for women to limit alcohol to no more than one drink a day and men no more than two drinks a day. And it's sort of a double-edged sword because we have documented benefit for a little bit of alcohol on a regular basis for cardiovascular disease, and it, that is also a very big killer. So I always say to women, you know what, you really, the decision to drink or not to drink needs to be very, very personal. You need to know your, uh, your, your current health risk, your, your uh, family history, and it should be an individual decision uh, that you make. Lastly, uh, if you are a woman of childbearing age and uh, may have a child or children, in your future, do everything you can to breastfeed. Um, ideally, you want to breastfeed exclusively for the first six months and continue thereafter along with supplementing, of course, with food. And the reason is because breastfeeding, the data, it, it, breastfeeding is a convincing, it, it's convincing that it will decrease the risk of premenopausal and postmenopausal breast cancer. In fact, the only thing that I'm aware of that has been, uh, as far as convincing data for the reduction of premenopausal uh, breast cancer in terms of diet and lifestyle is breastfeeding. There's a little bit of evidence for physical activity. The other thing with breastfeeding is we see uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, there is some evidence, I say limited, suggested, that it may diminish the risk of ovarian cancer. The other thing, it's also good for protecting your offspring's risk of cancer because we know that breastfeeding will decrease the risk of obesity in your offspring. Um, so I'm gonna, I see my cue, it's time to stop. And I want you to know that I have all this information plus some on a handout that I've loaded up on uh, the homepage of my, a link to it on the homepage of my website. So if you go to my website, just Google Dr. Ann. If you Google Dr. Ann, I'll be the first thing that pops up. Go into news and events and it'll say, click here to download Dr. Ann's Just Say Whoa to Cancer um, handout because it has all this information and actually fleshed out a little bit more. So thank you so much.